You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. The Pantanal isn't a country, city, or region made by man. It is a natural watery wonder found in the heart of South America, sprawling 42 million acres, making it the largest natural wetland on the planet. In 2020, the Houston Zoo unveiled what's claimed as the first of its kind habitat in America, that no other place in the country displays such awareness, appreciation, and call to action to preserve the Pantanal and its pristine wildlife. Now before we explore the 12 sections of what many proudly agree is the nation's greatest South American exhibit. If this is your first tour, we'd appreciate it if you hit those like, sub, and bell buttons to officially join this tour group. As one wetlands ends, that is, the zoo's award-winning Texas wetlands, another begins. You might see it first, but do not start in the Pantanal's exit. You will disrupt the flow of the last exhibit. The story actually begins to the right of the bug house. One of the biggest indicators that you've been transported to Brazil are the crossing signs preparing or hyping you up for the things that you are about to see. This rustic but vibrant entrance evokes eco-lodges found in the northern side of the Pantanal. In other words, they're overnight accommodations, usually built in natural remote areas, and it's elevated to protect its visitors and guides from the region's annual flooding. Since it looks like our feet are going to be dry for the remainder of the tour, we get to look at a very loud primate from the forest floor, the black and gold howler monkey. Though I wasn't lucky enough to see them, they are mixed with golden lion tamarinds and a red rumped agouti. Together they give this exhibit a specific theme. Just because the howlers look like they have a license to chill, doesn't mean they don't have instincts telling them to go to work. Their sign reads that everything in nature has a job. Howlers mainly eat leaves, while tamarinds prefer fruits and insects. That way they can share the forest without competing for food, and they are planting trees by dropping the seeds as they eat. And that's where the agouti comes in. They're the only ones that have the ability to crack open certain nuts to get to their seeds. And when they eat the seeds, they'll also spread them around even more with their own droppings. After all, a healthy forest with plenty of trees lets these monkeys stay high and dry during the flooding season. Thanks to a window that's in between the first and next enclosures, you and the monkeys can see a green anaconda. Florence here, named after the Pantanal's project manager, spent a lot of her time away from the main view, but it's exactly where you want her to be. If you have kids or don't mind getting your daily bear crawls out of the way, down this burrow is a once in a lifetime opportunity. While Florence lies and waits in the water for those monkeys to come to her, you can sit below a 13 foot long serpent and study the details of an anaconda that you can only do at a handful of other zoos. This new exhibit is one of the main reasons why the Pantanal can be so inspiring and it certainly is a major improvement over the old anaconda enclosure in the reptile house. This beautiful clear view underwater eventually blends with a second tank that's in the foreground but we'll get back to them in a bit. The Pantanal doesn't just have the larger, more famous species, but even made room for some of the jewels of the forest, like blue, anthonies, and bumblebee poison dart frogs on the left, and an emerald tree boa on the right that was unfortunately off display. Probably my favorite continuous aspect of the Pantanal are the small statues that are scattered around the entire attraction, but only one of them is sort of treated as if it were alive. The giant armadillo. It can be 70 pounds and 5 feet long, but they're almost never seen because they spend most of their days underground. And I read that's one of the reasons why they're so difficult to care for. Sadly, I don't see giant armadillos in the channel's future, so a statue will do for now. The Houston Zoo has two of the same kinds of animals on the opposite ends of the length scale. Their Natural Encounters building is home to Asian small-clawed otters, the smallest of its kind. In the Pantanal, say hello to the giant otter, the longest kind of otter. So long, I always hear people question whether or not they're seals. I mean, can you blame them? According to the signs, these party animals are Max and Marley, 
a brother and sister duo. Just like any other otter, they are so charismatic. But even the wildest animals need a break every now and then. I caught them snoozing in the morning, which is weird, right? They say zoo animals are usually up at this time. I found them active at around feeding time, which was close to 3 p.m. The two are fed restaurant-quality rainbow trout, tilapia, but their favorite was catfish. Speaking of which, inspired by the Los Angeles Zoo, they can swim right behind that fish tank. This tank's sign reads that each year during heavy rains, the Pantanal's many rivers flood, and when the rivers rise, the fish move into the forest. All that extra space gives them more access to food and shelter from predators. Safe and well-fed, the fish can breed, which means more food for the otters. Next up is another one of those animals that you'll hear long before you'll even see them. See? What you just heard lives with the blue-billed curacao, a critically endangered species the zoo works to breed and release into the wild. Sadly, I couldn't get a good shot of them, so this episode's conservation spotlight goes to the blue-throated macaw. According to Nat Geo, their population took the biggest hit in the 70s and 80s. More than a thousand of them were exported to be pets. Only around 400 remain in the wild, so any conservation action is critical. Houston proudly claims they're one of the few places in the country that breeds this critically endangered bird and works with colleagues in South America to protect them in their natural range. I've seen so many zoos in America just stick them on an island. Houston not only displays them in an enclosed aviary, allowing the macaws to be more flexible with their climbing skills, and it nearly brought a tear to my eye to be able to see them given the ability to fly. It just dawned on me that citizens of Houston may not be the biggest fans of one of the zoo's star attractions. Jaguars, the largest cat of the Americas. You can get whisker to whisker with female Vita from Memphis and male Tesoro from the Living Desert Zoo. They're separated for now but are here in hopes that they'll make some cubs. These shots definitely don't give the perfect picture, but this enclosure is gorgeous. Give it a couple of years and the back fencing might be virtually invisible. A major upgrade to their former home located by the lions, tigers, and Komodo dragons. It's not bad, but I definitely think it's a nicer fit for vultures. If you can't spot one of these cats, they're most likely hanging out in the brush on the left, closest to the guest viewing. I saw one of them active at noon, 2.45, and first thing in the morning, on the overhead walkway. Overhead catwalks have been a zoo trend over the last decade, but I love this one in particular because it was built to look as natural as it possibly can get. And when the jaguars are up there, they're actually close to the macaws, and when the two spot each other, the birds go berserk. I don't make the rules, but I think we can all agree that you can't really have a successful South American exhibit unless the largest rodents in the world are part of it. Approximately 80% of the Pantanal's floodplains submerge during the rainy seasons. Perfect for the capybara, because they are never far away from water. A necessity if they want to cross rivers or get away from those nosy jaguars. Now, their space was designed to blend in with the adjacent habitat. But first, one of the Pantanal's more immersive guest elements is this floating bridge that dares you to step off of the main path and trek over thick wetlands. There didn't appear to be anything on the right, but lurking on the left is the world's stiffest caiman. Houston's Pantanal recreation spans approximately two and a half acres of what was already developed land, including five or so hoofstock paddocks that are very similar to the ones that are on the other side of the zoo. The behind the scenes barn was kept intact, but the outdoor yards over here were combined to make one of the better habitats at the zoo. So far, we've seen South America represented through its forests, but this reminds you there's more to this continent than just jungles and wetlands. This is the grasslands habitat. Dry, beautiful, termite mound filled grasslands. Except for this part. Turns out that capybaras also have access to this, along with Coscaroba swans. Many say they're a very interesting bird from an evolutionary standpoint. Some say they look more like a goose rather than a swan, and they are classified in their own genus and have no recognized subspecies. Crested screamers 
I always knew they were talented with their vocals, but turns out this Houston heat can turn anyone into talented swimmers. Speaking of finding ways to cool off, the middle view is themed as a rancher's shelter to show that wildlife and cattle ranchers share the Pantanal. You won't find cattle here. Instead, you'll most likely be treated to a face full of giant bird. The Greater Rhea. Their nickname might be the Ostrich of South America, but I promise you that they are not ostriches. If you were to pin the two together side by side, it's noticeable that the African birds are five times larger in weight. I love the fact that you can meet them at the glass. I'm not just trying to state the obvious. The ostriches and zebras in the zoo's African forest used to share the space with the giraffes, and your view of the indoor barn looked a little something like this. However, the ostriches and the zebras have since been moved to their own space, so, it's nice to know that you can still get close enough to a giant bird to be able to read behind those thoughtless eyes. The Baird's Taper, or Tapir, is more elusive than they look. I would know, I barely saw them. And if you have trouble, you might be able to just barely see them through the grass to the right of this equipment box. Baird's Tapers do not live in the Pantanal. They're just filling in for their Brazilian cousins. Hey, whatever it takes to still have tapers. One, they're pretty cool. And two, this individual can help visitors finally realize that tapers are not anteaters. I saw them walking around the grasslands, but they and their pachyderm friends were signed with the capybaras. At the rodent's glass are anteater facts placed inside a termite mound, explaining all of the tools that they have to be able to get inside one. But that's for another time. The zoo also wants you to learn about one of the anteaters' greatest threats, and it's not big cats, wildfires, or habitat loss. They will roam for miles in search of food. In order to do that, they have to cross highways, putting them at great risk of becoming roadkill. There are researchers in the Pantanal that catch, tag, release, and track anteaters, learning where and how they travel. With that knowledge, it's hoped the governments will build crossings to make roads safer for all land animals in the region. If you look in this, it focuses on a giant nest in the grasslands. It only simulates the nest of a Jabiru stork. If you look in this one, in the far distance is, uh, well, we'll find out. We've seen some amazing creatures so far, but now we're finally getting to the good stuff. During construction, the zoo preserved and refurbished two flight cages. Not sure what this previously exhibited, but these days it's a wetlands aviary. And the world's largest wetland has everything a bird needs every year. As the heavy rains turn the Pantanal into a flooded plain, it becomes a sanctuary for over 600 birds that depend on water. This small slice of the Pantanal is home to at least 13 diverse species. And yes, there is a full list of animals in the comments. Jaguars and anacondas over our heads, otters going down slides. I could count the hairs on a taper, and yet I still wouldn't want to be anywhere else than the Pantanal's last exhibit. The second of the recycled flight cages may not feature as many species as the wetlands, but this savanna aviary not only has larger creatures, not only lets you walk amongst the birds, but you're walking in the former footsteps of a shoebill stork. A big loss for the zoo, but there still is a stork that you can say is just as prehistoric looking. This is the wood stork. I'd argue they're also just as intimidating too. They really make it seem like they are far taller than three and a half feet. Their natural range covers a good majority of South America, the shorelines of Central America, and is considered the only stork native to North America. They breed in the southeastern United States, and from July to September they will even pay a visit to eastern Texas. They seem to get along quite nicely with white-faced whistling ducks, black-faced ibises, southern lapwings, cock of the rocks. I may have missed the blue-billed curassows, but these waddled curassows or what I call greaser birds, were kind enough to make up for the no-show. And yes, the zoo is one of the top institutions for breeding this endangered species. Remember that weird looking hanging thing that we saw earlier? Well that is a nest, and that nest belongs to an oropendula. Their nesting habits are one of the most peculiar in the bird world. They resemble long woven baskets, very similar to the African golden weaver's nests. 
generally, Aura Pendula's individual baskets are a few feet longer and can hang up to 100 feet off the ground. And yes, they have been put to good use. There has been a chick, a few actually in the last few years. And thanks to yet another successful breeding program, the Houston Zoo claims to have the largest or one of the largest Aura Pendula flocks in North America. On top of creating an all-around amazing exhibit in terms of design, your advice on how you can preserve life in the Pantanal. Human involvement in nature is usually frowned upon, but Houston wants you to know that tourism can help save it. Imagine traveling to South America and coming across a jaguar or giant otters in their natural range, just like how you do at a zoo. You are paying for that experience. And when governments see that wildlife brings money to their countries, they're inspired even more to protect the wildlife and their habitats. One of the many reasons why the Pantanal was awarded by the AZA for excellence in exhibit design, and why, again, so many people agree, this is the greatest South American exhibit in the nation. So that will do it for now. Until next time, please stay wild, stay tuned, and thank you for watching Zoo Tours.